you came clap for her. Thank you, Betty. Let's all stand as we join together, worship, singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Oh, no, we're going to sing Angels We Have Heard All How about that? worship service. Um, if this is your first time joining us or if you have a prayer request, we ask that you go to our website at mayfieldroad.org slash connect and there you'll find our connect card and you can fill that out. You'll also find the link to that on our uh, comments section of our Facebook. Um, also, we want to Thank you for your continued support of the ministry here at Mayfield Road and remind you that there are several ways that you can do that or continue to do that and they are through our website by clicking on the giving tab through your bank's bill pay feature. If you're here in person, you may drop it off at one of the collection boxes, baskets, sorry, as you walk out the door this morning. Or you can come by any time during the week and drop it off in the mail slot by the church office doors. So if you're here in person or watching us on Facebook, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And let's continue to 
worship together. Will you stand as we sing together? kimapenzi ama anajua mtu amewahi dhulumiwa uko street kudhulumiwa kimapenzi whenever i was hanging out with the boys people would come to me and be like you know these boys are dangerous you know these boys are going to hurt you and you know you shouldn't be here and they're just despised by everyone only a few understand that these are just normal children who have been forced to the streets with different circumstances they're not loved they're actively insulted and abused and kicked show them love and they will respond with love show them a bad attitude and they will repel from you they are just children In 2009, 2010, I was serving as a photographer with the International Mission Board, and one of my last assignments was a story on a young lady working with street kids in Nairobi, Kenya. I would spend from four in the morning to ten at night with this group of 20 kids, getting to know them, hearing why they were on the streets, and the whole time I was like, oh my gosh, the Lord is going to call somebody to work with these kids. Like somebody needs to come do something. So I finally just said, Lord, are you calling me to go work with those boys? And I had peace. Like, I knew that that's what I was being called to do. Hopefully 13 boys will come to the shelter this morning. Um, 
and they'll be rescued off the streets. Ukotari. Honestly, there were so many years that I worked on the streets in Nairobi without a place to take boys. I would just get to know them and help them like in the small ways that I could. Um, and the fact that God has provided the shelter um, and given us opportunity to be rescuing kids off the streets and make a real difference in their life, it's really exciting. Like, life will not be the same for these boys. And Naivasha Children's Shelter, our mission is to rescue them from the streets, to help them to be rehabilitated, to get off drugs, to go through trauma counseling. And as much as we see that these kids need food and they need education and they need a bed to sleep in, they do, they need all of those things. But what they really need is the love of a family. They need to belong somewhere. They need to be well cared for. They need to know that they're loved. And we show them that through the love that the social workers give them here. We show them that by pointing to the love of Christ and we show them that by putting them back in their family where they belong with people who love them. One of our social workers, Elphis, has spent hours looking for one kid that's lost that he wants to be able to have a new life. Um, and it's not just Elphis, all of the social workers at the shelter are amazing. They go to the streets every day and every night. They get to know the boys, they get to hear their story, know why they came to the streets, know what happened in their family, and offer them a way out. I talk to them, I make them understand that despite everything that you're going through, there is hope and there is someone who cares. That's why I'm here. I had seen enough of orphanages, I had worked with enough organizations that I knew the best place for any child is in their family. And we don't just take them home and drop them off. What we do is we spend a lot of time going to the family and finding out what sent that child to the streets. Was it the influence of peers? Was it poverty at home? And then spend a lot of time working on that issue with the family. Every child that's placed back at home, they follow them until they reach the age of 18 or they finish school. Just to make sure that child has no chance of going back to the streets, everything is fine, they have enough food, they're in school, they invest their lives in these children. I'm sure that these kids, if given a chance and a place to make their lives, for sure they are going to change and make a better generation to come. I just want to sincerely say thank you. It is because of Southern Baptist that I am able to be here. The shelter is able to keep running. I'm able to serve in this way because of your gifts to the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering and the Cooperative Program. And it's miraculous to see a child that was alone living on the streets and hopeless uh, reunited with their family. This is the model that works. This is what helps to get kids back home where they should be and where they want to be. church family during this season of Advent, one of the things that our church has done historically joining with churches all over our country is to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, this is an offering that goes entirely to fund mission work all over the world. Every single dollar that you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to support missionaries all across the globe. And so this is just one story of how our support in the past has been used to continue God's work in the world. And so for the rest of this month, each Sunday, we're going to see a different story, just to get another glimpse of how God has used our generosity to expand his kingdom. And so one of the things that I want us to do as a church is, again, to be praying about this year, uh, what is God calling each of us to do in giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? Um, the way you can give that simply is just, uh, like any other check, make it out to, to Mayfield Road Baptist Church. But in the memo line, just drop the letters LMCO, Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. And you can give that any time now uh, through the second week of January. And uh, we're grateful for the opportunities to partner with our sister churches across this country uh, in order to uh, carry out uh, the gospel message throughout the world. And so um, we're grateful for what God is doing in our world and that he would choose to use us in that. And of course, we know uh, our world is in need of hearing the good news of Jesus. 
A few other things, of course, I want us to remind us, uh, remind us to be praying for, um, for Guy Willard and his family and the homegoing of Diane. And uh, if you are on our email list, you know the service is tomorrow. And so please be sure to be in prayer for them. And uh, for many across our church family struggling with different uh, illnesses or different, um, just, just the challenges of a difficult season. And uh, of course, we know uh, even in the midst of difficulty, this season reminds us that Christ came to bring hope, to bring answers, uh, to bring good news to those who are walking in darkness. And uh, so we're grateful that we get to celebrate um, and that uh, in this season, uh, we're able to, to recognize and to worship uh, the good news that God has provided for us in sending Jesus. And so if you would join with me as we pray. Father, we thank you for how you have been at work. Father, what we celebrate uh, this time of year and you sending your son, you sending an answer for our sins, an answer for our distress, an answer for uh, just all the, the brokenness of our world. We celebrate that. And we also understand that we play a part in continuing to proclaim that good news all around the world. And so, Father, I do pray that you would continue to work through us, through our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, that you would, that you would continue to advance your kingdom. God, that you would work through your church that you'd work through men and women and boys and girls who are just proclaiming the good news of Jesus and what a difference it makes. Father, I pray that as we worship, we would be mindful that we're not just celebrating something that happened a long time ago. We're celebrating what you've done and what you're continuing to do and what you've invited us to be a part of. And so let that be what shapes our worship this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. An angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us.
Father, we praise you because of because of just how perfectly you've provided for us. Father, we hear that familiar story read. And again, that's not the way we would have done it. But you did it in the way that's right. And so we recognize your kindness, your generosity, your goodness, but also your perfect wisdom. And so, Lord, we pray that you would would continue just to enable us to rest in your perfect wisdom. to trust in your faithful guidance for us and to learn to follow after you and to follow in your ways. Father, shape us to be the people you've called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church family, good morning. It's good to be 
back with you. Uh, appreciate your excusing my absence last week. Uh, I promise you, you got the better end of the deal. A um, few things just to, uh, to let you know about as we prepare to celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus as a church family in the weeks ahead. I want to tell you about some of the special things that we have uh, planned that we can look forward to together. Um, now, obviously, things are going to look a little different this Christmas season for, for all of us, right? Um, and so when we started thinking about some of our favorite traditions around here, like our choir concert and our Christmas Eve service, and we started looking at the logistics involved, you know, following the necessary restrictions, you know, trying to figure out reservations with families and would anybody want to do that, and um, just, just all of the, the limitations that we were uh, facing, uh, the question came to mind, what if God is leading us to do something different this year. You know, frequently, that's how God directs us in ways. When, when we, we kind of find closed doors, sometimes it's because there's a different door that he has for us at that time. And so um, that's kind of what we've been praying through as a staff and with some of our key leaders. And um, so here's what we're going to do this year. Uh, on December 20th, a Sunday evening from 6 to 8 p.m., we're going to host a drive-through nativity experience in our parking lot. It's going to be a multi-scene deal where we drive through and see different scenes from the biblical story. Uh, it's going to be set up. It's going to have live animals and have uh, some effects to it, so it'll bring the story to life. Um, Several in our church are already working on different parts of this, and I, I got to say, I'm really excited about kind of how it's coming together, and God's put some really uh, creative and, um, frankly, skilled people in our church family, and so it's going to be a really neat experience. Uh, it's going to be something where you can invite your friends, your family to come and to join it and to be a part of it from the safety of their own car. Uh, it's going to be something wide open to our community, so we're not limited by uh, location or space or anything like that. Uh, and it's going to be just a neat experience where we're able to walk them through. They get a guide with the scriptures on it, uh, and we're able to just connect uh, in a special way. Um, also, the next night, uh, we'll be sharing a special uh, Christmas program featuring our frontline singers uh, that will premiere on Facebook and YouTube and then we'll be showing it each successive night leading up to Christmas Day so that as you have your gatherings, however big or small uh, you choose to do that, you're able to participate in our Christmas service there uh, at a time of your choosing. And so uh, we're excited about just how God will use a different approach and uh, again are, are grateful for uh, just how God directs and guides and so I want to remind you that's coming up uh, December 20th, 6 to 8 p.m., entirely free. Uh, invite your friends and people in your circle um, because I think it's going to be a neat time for us to enjoy together. Now, I want us to think about a time when you struggled to do what was right. We've all been there. You know, sometimes just even discerning What's the right thing to do can be hard. Harder than we maybe give it, you know, credit for at times. A friend of mine is a guy named Randy. Uh, years ago, he was uh, doing mission work on a Pacific island. And uh, he went around training local pastors, uh, encouraging them, kind of giving them the basics and, and strengthening them as they started churches and, and shared the gospel and all that. But in the country where he was serving, it was not legal to go and to do mission work. And so the time came where government official pulled him aside and said, hey, are you a missionary? Are you paid to be here to do you know, Christian work? And the question is, should he, should he lie and maybe continue to do the work? I mean, the work he was doing was important. Should he tell the truth? If he is, he's almost certainly being kicked out of the country. I mean, there was... You know, there was an argument to be made for either side. Ultimately, he told the truth and he was kicked out of the country. Was it the right thing to do or not? 
Sometimes knowing the right thing to do isn't that hard. Sometimes what's right is really, really clear. But what makes it hard is there's a cost to it. I learned this back in second grade. I was hanging out after school and there were some kids that their teacher had asked them to clean the erasers. You know, these were the, this is South Arkansas. We still had the chalkboard erasers. So they were out there cleaning the erasers, but they were doing it in a destructive manner, throwing it against the building and, you know, doing all that. And I, I just knew that wasn't right. And so I went and told them they should stop. And then the kid picked up a rock and threw it at me. And I realized doing what's right comes with a cost sometimes. And, uh, you know, maybe you've experienced that. Well, that, that's a lesson that we learn and we experience and sometimes we wrestle through. And the question is, is, it, is doing what, what's right, is it worth the cost? Last week, Martin stepped in and started our Christmas series uh, that we're calling Welcome the King. And it, each week in this series, we're going to look at uh, some of the main characters from that first Christmas that we read about in the Bible. And look at what we can learn from them, what they have to teach us as we prepare to welcome the king and observe Advent together this year. We saw last week how Mary obeyed God and how she boldly just put her yes on the table. Said, yes, Lord, this is what you're calling me to do. This is the assignment that you've given to me. I am your servant. I will do as you say. Let it be exactly as you've said to me. Just incredible, bold obedience. She said, this is your call I'm there for it. Well, today we're going to look at Joseph's story and see things from his perspective. Uh, so if you have your Bibles close by, let me ask you to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to start reading in verse 18 says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, what, what's going on here back then in their time uh, couples would be betrothed for about a year. Now, they wouldn't like live together and, and all that, but they would be bound in a covenant which essentially was as, as unbreakable as a marriage vow. And then they would have a year where they would be apart. This was basically to prove whether or not the woman was faithful. At the end of the year, they would be wed formally and would be a married couple. It's during this pledge time when Mary turns out to be pregnant. Now, Joseph, of course, he has a problem to, to solve. He has, you know, he has to discern what's the right thing to do in this situation. Now, when it says here that he's faithful to law, some of your translations will say Joseph was a righteous man. What that means is Joseph sought to do what was right always. He sought to obey God's law in every circumstance of, of life. He was a guy who was a faithful and devout. He observed the Sabbath every week. He observed the food laws. He was there in the synagogue week by week. He went to Jerusalem for the festivals. He was consistent each day. In getting up and quoting Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. He recited that every morning. He recited that every evening. That's what it meant to be a righteous man. You do what's right. You live your life, not just as like a token, but every part of your life is oriented around doing what's right around following God's law. And so Joseph always is trying to do that. And even when he's confronted with Mary being pregnant, there's a couple of different ways he could go. 
He could expose her to public disgrace. He could shame her and humiliate her in front of the whole community. He could possibly even ask for financial compensation from her family. But he doesn't do any of that. Instead, we learn that he is righteous. He does what's right. But he's also compassionate. He just wants to divorce her quietly. Not to shame her. Not to disgrace her but to make it as easy as possible and go on. Now, this is the obvious answer for him because a righteous man does not take an unrighteous woman as his bride. That's the right thing to do. Now, if he had done that, his reputation would be intact. His peers would have said, Joseph, once again, you've done what's right. Once again, you're an honorable man. We recognize you. We appreciate that you're righteous and compassionate. We continue to welcome you in the club. We continue to admire you because you're a man who does what's right. But that's not what happened. Verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. The angel says, don't be afraid. Take her home as your wife. And this was no small thing for Joseph. What this means for him is giving up his reputation as a righteous man, a man who follows the law, who always does what's right. It means going against what looks like the right thing to all of his peers, all of his buddies, all of the guys that kind of welcomed into this club of you know, guys who do what's right. He's going to be getting the side eye from these righteous men for the rest of his life. He could expect these kinds of consequences where they look down and say, so what's wrong with Joseph? Maybe he's not as righteous as we thought. Maybe he doesn't always do the right thing. The ways that people had once treated him with respect and admiration would now be replaced by suspicion. Things just would not be the same for Joseph anymore. But because he's doing the right thing. You see the tension here? There's what everybody else thinks is right. What appears to be right. What Joseph grew up his whole life thinking, this is the right way. But God's at work in this circumstance. And so now he tells Joseph, no, this is the right way. And Joseph knows if he follows, if he does what's actually right, there will be a cost to it. Now, none of us will ever walk in Joseph's shoes, but probably all of us have or will face moments like this at one time or another when we choose whether we're going to do what everyone around us thinks is right, what appears to be right, or are we going to do what God has compelled us to do, what we're impressed is right. You know, this is the thing that we talk to our kids growing up about, you know, that just because your friends say it's right doesn't mean it's the right thing. But the truth is we don't actually outgrow that, that dilemma, do we? We continue to face these moments, these times where yeah, we have to choose what's right and what looks to be right to everybody else may not actually be the way that the Lord is leading us. And so how do we do that? How do you work through that? What's, you know, what's the trick? What's the, what's the measurement? What's the gauge? How do we discern the right way? And then how do we do it even when we know it comes with a cost? couple of things I think we need to 
need to recognize. First of all, get clear on who you're trying to please. Are you trying to please everybody around you? You say, this is the right way? Is Joseph trying to please his crowd of friends, his righteous friends who are saying, Joseph, this is the way, you know, this is the way you should go. You know that. We've talked about this. It's obvious. You've studied the scriptures. Divorce her quietly. Move on. Or are we trying to please the Lord, the one who is directing our path? Is Joseph trying to please the one who has shown him what's going on? Who sent the angel who said, don't be afraid. Now we'd love it if we could have both ways, right? If you can please everybody and please the Lord, you know, do what's right and everybody agrees and it's all good. And sometimes it works out like that, right? But there are times where it's a clear choice. The Lord's leading us in one way. And it's not apparent to everybody else. Sometimes not even apparent to those around us who follow Jesus and want to do life his way. And that's when it gets tough. And that's when we have to just be real clear about it. Who is it that we're trying to please? And if you're a struggling people pleaser, like a lot of us, like I am, this is hard. It's hard to look somebody in the face and see disappointment. When you do what you know is right, isn't it? I mean, there's something in us that just thinks, I'm doing what's right. I've prayed about this. I'm following scripture. I'm doing what is the best thing I know to do. And, and something in us just thinks we should get like a pat on the back for that, right? And we will, but not from the crowds, not from those around us. The pat on the back we're looking for is not from everybody else. It's just from the Lord. Sometimes that's all we get. Joseph, from this point forward, may have never been called a righteous man again by anybody else. But God recognizes him as that because he did what was right. So we need to get clear on who we're trying to please. Second thing, we need to get clear on the difference between reputation and identity. See, reputation is what everybody else thinks about us. Identity is who we actually are. And, you know, er everybody else sees our reputation, and of course, we want a, a good and honorable reputation. But sometimes, if we get too tangled up on reputation and identity, we can kind of end up following. You know, following somebody else's plan, somebody else's direction, rather than following the way God's calling us to go. Scott Maniot, in his book, The Jesus Creed, said that one of the key steps of spiritual growth is learning to disentangle our reputation from our identity. Understanding that who we are, what really matters, is what God says about us. About who we actually are, who God is forming us to be. And sometimes that means the reputation takes a hit in order for who we actually are to be who God's calling us to be. And so Joseph works through that. Just like we're all called to at different points, different times in our lives. And here's how he handles it. Verse 24 says, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Again, we don't know if Joseph was ever called righteous again. We don't know if, you know, if there were friendships that were broken that he never really experienced repair in. 
But we know what his obedience brought about. We know how he did what was right. And ultimately, we see how God used his obedience. And so for all of us, the the lesson as we prepare to welcome our king is we need to be people focused on following God's lead. Getting clear on who we're trying to please. For followers of Christ, Sometimes it means serving an audience of one. Getting clear on the difference between our reputation and our identity. If God says you're his child, you're obedient, you're doing what's right, you're following his way. That's enough. We can live with the hit to our reputation because that's temporary. God will prove in the end what's true. And so church family, let's let's be faithful. Let's follow the way that's right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the example that we see in Joseph, but most of all for the truth, knowing that What you say about us is what matters most. That because you see who we truly are, you know what you're calling us to do, you know the way in which we should go. That all we're really called to do is to be faithful and to obey. And so, Father, give us the courage and the wisdom so that we can discern the way you're calling us to go, even when it's tough. And the courage to let the chips fall where they may. Father, I pray that you'd continue to shape us to be men and women, wholly devoted to following after you. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.